With just a half hour delay, we can start this uh, uh, session that is supposed uh, to follow on one of the difficult nuts to crack that we have uh, in, the, in the path to a stronger and more united Europe because we want to focus a little bit on uh, the spending side and the uh, possibility of reaching maybe a fiscal, a fiscal capacity for Europe, uh, which uh, also is, as you all know, probably crucially linked also on the success of the ongoing trial that is called Next Generation EU. So I'm here, I'm David Rinaldi, Director of Studies and Policies at the Foundation for European Progressive uh, Studies, one of the political foundations uh, partners of this nice uh, three-day getaway in uh, Pontignano. Um, and we have thought together with the vision uh, to structure this session around one of the joint projects that we have that is called Recovery Watch, uh, which is not a, a structured observatory, but is a, a, a very informal gathering of uh, um, organizations uh, led by three progressives uh, uh, think tank, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung, and Institut Emil van der Veld, that is the think tank of the Belgian socialists, actually. Uh, together, we have created uh, uh, a package, this recovery watch, in which we want to check the national recovery and resilience plans, how they can uh, really advance uh, our union and our member states in the direction of uh, uh, you know, climate investment, digital investment, trying to have some comparative analysis, what are the novelty that the social measure brings in. We have been looking at, for instance, that you can find uh, uh, papers already on, online at FEPS slash Recovery Watch on, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, comparative analysis of the child policy measures within, uh, within the national recovery plans or how place sensitive the different plans were or uh, how much the care sector have been, uh, have been addressed, how uh, um, structurally transformative the climate session of the plans were. But today we look at, uh, at two, uh, in front of me, I have Francesco, and just this week we have published one with Vision uh, that instead looks at how the digital investment included in the next generation EU can transform the delivery of health and education. So it's the good part of the digital spending in providing access, uh, access to education. But the digital uh, transition was the session of, of the previous session. Here we focus instead on what are the changes for European economic governance uh, linked to the RRF and to the next generation EU. And we can benefit from two uh, distinguished uh, professors that have been following, leading and writing on two different, uh, on two different uh, uh, topics. Uh, the first we will look at uh, from uh, uh, done in collaboration with uh, Offshe Sciences Po Paris, and we have here their director of study, Jerome Creel. Thanks a lot for joining us from Paris. Uh, it's a study on making the next generation EU a permanent tool. So uh, it was a big novelty, big novelty on joint borrowing. Uh, can it be replicated inside also a look on the uh, public, uh, European public goods that can, be, that can be financed. And very importantly, uh, exactly today, this is an occasion for us to publish and launch uh, the second study that is available uh, as of one hour ago on FEP's, uh, West, uh, Fe FEP's uh, uh, website. Uh, uh, we have a nice study on governing the RRF with a complex title because the study goes on the looks at the drafting, implementing and monitoring on the national recovery and resilient plans as an interactive model, uh, multi-level process. And it is exactly this feeling of, you know, uh, um, milestones, targets for money. 
can that be a blueprint for the future of EU spending? We will be asked this question to our lead uh, scientist and author, Jonathan Zeitling, emeritus, uh, emeritus professor at the University of Amsterdam and also founder there of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, now uh, also fellow at the European University Institute. So we will have these two uh, relatively academic contributions to try to check what we have learned from the RRF and the Next Generation EU. And we will go after that to Marco Buti, uh, that you are all, uh, uh, I, think, I think you all know him for his work at the Commission DG Acfin first, and then as head of cabinet of the Commissioner Gentiloni. But as of, uh, as of this month, uh, he instead took office at the uh, European University Institute, where he is the Tommaso Padua Schioppa Chair for Economic and Monetary Integration in our, our uh, union. Uh, after Marco, we will uh, extend and expand the discussion. Now, by now, you are certainly familiar with Barbara Colm, our uh, uh, great Vice President uh, from the Austrian Central Bank. Uh, for a comment, uh, a comment. To my left, uh, Le, Luca Mezzomo, head of uh, macroeconomic analysis at Intesa, at Intesa San Paolo, leading, uh, leading Italian and European bank. And connected, you see, on top of our speakers, Mario Nava. Uh, Mario Nava, uh, he's connected from, uh, from Brussels, where he is the director general at the, at the Secretariat of the Commission in the Director General that follows uh, the ref, sort of support to the reforms. Uh, so that he struggles, he struggles daily to help member states to do the reforms and we have to check if this system helped. But uh, we have little time, so I shut up, but I have introduced all of you and we go directly first, uh, first with an input uh, uh, by Jerome and then by Jonathan. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction, David. Thanks to FEPS for uh, asking us to work on this uh, tricky issue. And thanks to Francesco for welcoming, welcoming us here uh, in Siena. So uh, I try to be brief and I, watch, I wish I could uh, recall first the context of the recovery and resilience facility, then discuss rapidly about the possible results he may have achieved and about the, the future based on this study that you were mentioning, David, with my co-authors at, uh, at the OFC. So the, the, the context is the following. So the Next Generation EU and the RRF are part of a one-off program with gradual and very limited amount of money because it's for 27 countries. It has increased the EU budget by less than 75%. It's not a small number, but since we start from an EU budget that is not that big, it's not a big amount. This uh, project, this proposal and program have been developed at a moment when monetary policy was very accommodative and during an economic crisis, the post-COVID uh, crisis. It also includes very limited risk sharing because this risk sharing will only occur in the very long run, if the EU has not been able to provide new own resources to pay back for the debt that has been mutualized. It may well be that there is some risk sharing, but in the long run, and only on half of the amounts that have been distributed, because it's only on the grants that this risk sharing might occur. This program is also targeted towards the needs of the countries rather than being proportional on the relative size of the countries, meaning that there has been more money for Italy than for Germany, which is usually not the case, except in the cohesion policy, which is a tiny part of the EU budget. And also, this program is targeted towards two prominent challenges, namely the ecological transition and the digitalization transition. Uh, I, I want to take just a minute recalling that the ECB has been performing very expansionary and accommodative policies since the next generation EU has started. 
namely the continuation of the public sector purchase program, the PSPP, and also the development, and now the end, of the pandemic emergency purchase program. The amounts are tremendous, but the objectives have nothing to do with the recovery, nor with resilience. PSPP was meant at pushing up inflation expectations, while the, P the PEP was there to try to limit financial fragmentation and try to escape bank instability. Okay. So, and these policies by the ECB have been performed without any risk sharing because the capital key at the ECB equity has been fulfilled in these two programs, although some flexibility was allowed with the PEP, but not that much used. So the, the, the reason I wanted to, to recall that is that the next generation EU was born at a moment when monetary policy and fiscal policies were complementary one to another. They were not having the same objective, although they were performed at the same moment. Results of next generation EU and RRF before thinking about the future. Uh, my, my, my first point is that the main result of RRF and the next generation EU is political and symbolic because we've seen the European Union act swiftly after the COVID and during the COVID-19 crisis to try to limit the cost to the population. We've been getting uh, through the red line of debt mutualization and we've been targeting the policies towards quite undisputed challenges like the ecological transition and the digitalization transition. So I think it was very good to see the EU defend the interests of the EU citizens and almost in real time. Okay? So I don't think we should underestimate this political uh, advantage of next generation EU because the EU can deliver, okay? which is not always the case or not always felt this way. What about other results? It's very difficult to say if next generation EU will achieve the objectives that was given to it. I think Jonathan will deal much more on that than I will. But what is important to recall is that although it was decided in July, December 2020, money has started flowing only in 2021 and the peak of funds will just arrive in 2023. So since the money has not come back entirely, has not come in entirely, it's very difficult to tell whether it will have achieved and delivered the results. So I will take my, my cap as an academic and say that on the theoretical side, there, there is a consensus these days among most macroeconomists, if not all macroeconomists, that a fiscal policy will be proving affected provided it is timely, targeted, and temporary. Okay. So in this respect, next generation EU looks like the perfect macroeconomic policy. It was a reaction in real time that has proven that there was someone, someone discussing about the problem and trying to fix them. It was considered one-off and temporary, and it was targeted to those in need, so it seems it, it may have proven uh, effective. Another consensus in the literature considers that the tools on which you use monet fiscal policy, sorry, is also important. It does matter. And public investment is considered as having more impact on the, on the economy than public consumption. And in this respect, this next generation EU program and the RRF are funding public investment. It also goes in the good direction. Should it be continuing? The problem is the context has substantially changed. Inflation is back. Monetary policy is, very, is no longer accommodative. I don't know if it is restrictive, considering that the nominal interest rates are still below inflation rates, so maybe it's not that much restrictive, but it's no longer accommodative. Monetary policy is weighing on interest payments that have been going up, and that's not good for interest payments on debt. 
and we have geopolitical, geopolitical risk that has increased and that raises a new concern, namely defense. So some ask us, FEPS ask us, to, to deal with next generation 2.0. Should it be continuing with needs expressed by national governments and only ex post control? Okay, so our answer in the, in the paper is, is no. We don't need a next generation EU 2.0, and I think uh, yesterday Marco made a similar, a similar point. The, the, the reason is that I think in quite consistently with Marco, we are willing to deal with the provision of European public goods, but decided at the European level, not decided by national governments one after the other. Why? Why do we think we need a European reply to the different problems we're facing? First reason, we're facing protectionism by foreign countries, like China, but also by some allies, like the US, and certainly it requires a reaction by the EU. And since European competition and state aid policies are a European competence, this reaction must certainly be European. Second point, we, sh we share common challenges like ecological issues, health protection issues, now defense, that certainly require the European provision of public goods to, let's say, generate some economies of scale and maybe continue to position the EU as a benchmark in this respect. Another point that relates to the provision of European public goods at the European level is also the struggles between countries once there is an amount of money that they wish to allocate to their own country, own industry at the expense of their partners within the EU. Certainly, we need to limit the biases in favor of nationalism and combat this economic nationalism. Still on the political front, I think we should not forget that the social crisis that has stemmed from the redistributive consequences of the inflation surge may, at some moment, divert Europeans from the EU project. For some citizens, my wonder where the EU was, where the inflation surge reduces substantially their purchasing power. The EU was discussing, the member states were discussing about some sanctions against Russia that took a while to be decided upon, that do not touch that much upon gas, it isn't touch upon gas, which discussed about petrol and, and oil, but during that moment when there were discussions at the EU level, these were our governments, national governments, that were fighting with the margins for maneuver they could have, the consequences on purchasing power of this inflation surge. I come from a country, France, where they have, there has been a whatever it takes policy that has been very costly, but that has permitted to reduce substantially the inflation surge, and usually at the ECB, they love France these days because it has permitted to reduce the average inflation rate all over the Euro area. We are a relatively big country, and we have the lowest inflation rate. Not at this moment. Spain is doing better, but we have been doing quite well thanks to policy decisions. Why should we be going further in uh, uh, providing these European public goods? Also because the reaction by the EU of sometimes relabeling EU project, I saw in a tweet by Redeker that it seems that the sovereign wealth funds will not be considered something as new as one should have thought uh, at the beginning, or sometimes we see the reaction of the EU reallocating funds. In the Repower EU, there are funds that are coming entirely from the funds of next generation EU that have not been used so far. So it's always the same amount of money. I think the people in Europe, they deserve more and better. So maybe we need a new project. And if we look at the European service, we can see that the Europeans they're asking for more Europe, not less Europe, but certainly they think that they need a project to, to, to struggle for. So in this uh, FEPS policy study, we decided to recommend 
uh, European impetus in favor of the provision of European public goods, but without a treaty change. Okay, so it's not, it's tricky not to have a treaty change, but uh, not to have a treaty change, yes, but we, we thought that it would create an open Pandora's box that I think the member states are not willing to open, so that we thought it was important to remain in the treaties. And to do so, we proposed the creation of a European Public Investment Agency that would provide the ex-ante orientation towards public investment, deciding on the supply and the amount in the supply of European public goods and the allocation across member states with an ex post control by the agency uh, with, with the Commission. And we, in this paper, discuss about the taxonomy of public investments, where we distinguish three possible advantages with the supply of public goods, producing externalities that certainly would accelerate also private investment, increasing the returns to scale, and also lowering uncertainty in a world of high uncertainty. I'm almost done. While this new uh, European agency could be backed by debt mutualization again, we argue in the paper on a different path. We think that the funding should come from taxes. Okay. The reason is not only related to the fact that the interest rates have increased and with this increase in the interest rates, the fiscal burden would be increasing if we had more debt. The reason for taxing in order to supply European public goods is political. If we have a federal leap towards a long-lasting, if not a permanent, provision of European public goods, this will have democratic consequences. If national governments do not directly decide upon, uh, on the, on the, upon on the EU-funded public investment on their own territory, who represents the national and European interests of the people? It will be the EU itself. So in this project, we consider that the political leap will require that Parliament is more involved than ever. Decision must be uh, uh, discussed with the European Parliament. But we think this is not enough to go through the European Parliament, because following the adage that no representation can work without taxation, the European Public Investment Agency must also be backed by its own resources. So I conclude saying that the RRF experience so far shows that tax funding requirements are generally postponed. So I can't be too optimistic that new own resources to fund a European Public Investment Agency will arise soon. Okay. But the road will be consistent, generating the needed investment for households and firms in Europe while identifying the provision of new European expenditures with European taxes. This is what we propose in this paper. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, uh, Jerome. Uh, I take one second uh, to give the possibility to our technicians to hire, it, uh, hire the slides of uh, Professor Zeitling online to recap uh, uh, what you said in maybe one nutshell. Do we want another next generation EU? No, but the reason is because there's too little Europe. Uh, is there's Europe in the spending and too little Europe in the strategic planning, so that we need more, uh, uh, in, uh, more intelligence from Europe uh, in, in, the, uh, in the spending side. And perhaps uh, following uh, experts will uh, we'll respond to that. Professor Zeitling, uh, okay. what can we learn from the RRF governance? Yes, quite, quite a lot, I think. I've taken the title that was proposed for this session, can milestone-based investments and reforms work for a stronger Europe? And I'm going to give you an answer to that. Hmm. Assuming that this, I can advance the slides. What am I doing wrong? Ah, okay, I'm holding it wrong, okay. And so my answer in one sentence is yes, but not in its current form. And the conclusion is based on the study of this FEPS policy study co-authored uh, co with David Bockhorst and Edgar Zaimanis, uh, governing the RF 
drafting, implementing, and monitoring national recovery and resilience plans as an interactive multi-level process. As David has said, it's just out today. We're totally thrilled. We've been working on this very hard for a year, so um, it's great that it can be now out uh, for this uh, this conference. And our study covers eight member states. They vary in terms of their size, but also in, in terms of the RF financial envelope. That is, how much money did they get from the Next Generation EU program in term related to their GDP. So we look at Belgium, Croatia, Estonia, Italy, Latvia, Portugal, Slovakia, and Spain. And we also look at three contrasting uh, cases, uh, Austria, uh, uh, Germany, and the Netherlands, which got much more, less money uh, proportionally, were also much less ambitious uh, in their plans. And um, our findings are based on uh, very extensive documentary research, but also about 60 interviews uh, with commission and national officials who were involved in the process, uh, and in some countries also other domestic uh, stakeholders. So if we want to say what is new, what's original about the governance design of the RF, really there are three elements. The first is what we can call a demand-driven process of plan formulation. So it, the plans are really driven by the countries themselves, and that uh, has laid the foundation uh, for strong national ownership, of course, stronger in some countries than others. Secondly, uh, reforms uh, in this model uh, are linked to investments through positive incentives uh, rather than uh, negative sanctions. So unlike, let's say, the Growth and Stability Pact, which was built on negative sanctions that have never been implemented here, we have positive financial support from the EU uh, for uh, investments which are in turn linked to reform. And let me say both of those uh, elements of the governance design I think are very positive uh, and have worked relatively well. We have a lot to say about them uh, in the study. Now I want to focus on the third element which is the performance-based financing. And here the idea is that uh, payments from the EU to member states are tied to the fulfillment of predetermined milestones and targets rather than costs, as in uh, the structural and cohesion funds and other uh, programs. The, the slogan is results, not uh, receipts. And for reasons I'll explain to you in a moment, uh, while the idea of performance-based financing I think is also positive uh, and valuable, the way it has been implemented uh, in the RRF I think is problematic and I think we could do better in future programs. So here is this key weakness of the RRF governance model and this we document very extensively uh, through interviews uh, with national officials and also commission uh, officials. So the mechanical linkage of payment uh, to fulfillment of fixed milestones and targets. I mean, in a way, the idea is it's familiar. Uh, if you take your clothes to the dry cleaner, you have to show the receipt afterwards in order to get your clothes back. So no delivery, you don't fulfill the milestones and targets, you don't get uh, the money. Now the problem is this mechanical linkage of payment to fulfillment of milestones and targets fixed at the beginning uh, we find often directs attention on both sides, that is the Commission side and uh, also the national side, away from the underlying purpose of the reforms and investments. And so it involves a lot of human resources uh, which are not really productive, they're not about improving the implementation of the reforms and the, uh, the investments, uh, but instead verifying whether for example, the, the right documents have been produced to justify the, the payment uh, request. And this in turn uh, tends to sap the national ownership at all levels uh, of government within the member states. And secondly, the inflexibility of this variant of performance-based financing makes it very difficult to adjust the milestones and targets to unforeseen circumstances. It, it can be done. Uh, we, that has been done 
uh, also through Repower EU, but it is a very complex uh, and cumbersome exercise to reopen national plans. You have to show it's due to uh, objective circumstances. And there's no um, mechanism, no provision for learning from implementation experience during the, um, the, the execution of the reforms and, pro and uh, investment projects themselves. And I think it, it's, this is a little bit surprising because we know that commission officials discussed uh, these ideas with uh, officials of the World Bank and so on uh, before uh, the, uh, the RF regulation was drafted, but uh, what we find is that the way the EU has designed uh, this performance-based financing system ignores the lessons of past international experience, both positive and negative. And there is a, a wealth of studies, both at the international level uh, with development uh, aid and uh, at the national level in terms of performance-based budgeting, which shows that it often does not work very well. It promotes uh, gaming, it promotes uh, goal displacement, and it often is more symbolic than substantive in transformation. So, uh, on the positive side, if we look at best practice in the management of innovative investment and reform projects uh, in the private sector, let's say, uh, in contracting for innovation between a biotech company and a pharma company to develop a new drug or a new vaccine, uh, or in the, the public sector, if we think of things like uh, ARPA-E for innovative energy in the U.S. or uh, PEMANDU in Malaysia, which uh, you know, uh, oversaw both um, in big investment projects like new transport systems, but also uh, reforms like reforms of taxation, uh, we find there uh, that what you typically have in, in these successful management of, pro of projects is what I, I call diagnostic monitoring, I'll define that in the next slide, of broad revisable goals and a system of joint problem solving, not a focus on the fulfillment of predetermined milestones and targets. So what is diagnostic monitoring? And here I want to quote uh, from my friend and collaborator, Charles Sable from Columbia Law School, uh, ongoing supervision and periodic review by stakeholders of problems encountered in realizing initial and avowedly provisional plans with the aim of devising effective methods of implementation when that's possible or revisiting project goals when there's good reason to think it's not. And why do you need this kind of uh, system of monitoring? Because of high and rising levels of uncertainty and heterogeneity. And these, in turn, undermine the possibility of relying on ex-ante plans whose assumptions will likely prove incorrect or incomplete and in need of revision during the implementation uh, process. And the point here is this kind of system of monitoring is aimed at facilitating and organizing problem solving by the actors concerned, not using the threat of punishment for bad performance as an incentive for good uh, behavior. And we, we, interestingly, we also found when we talked to national officials who had experience of uh, long-term um, of, of long-term reform and investment projects that they had a very similar idea of how they should be done. So we have a, a recommendation here, which is for the future at any rate, to revise the RF performance-based financing system to allow greater flexibility in monitoring investment and reform commitments through a multi-tiered system of diagnostic monitoring. So that would mean moving away from the conception in the RRF of national plans as putatively complete contracts uh, in order to incorporate explicit processes for mod modifying milestones and targets in response not only to uh, unanticipated changes in external circumstances like uh, the, the invasion of Ukraine and the, um, uh, the inflation in energy prices, but also to take account of lessons learned in the course of project implementation itself. Now, given the uh, limits of 
the, the Commission's staffing and informational capacity is very understandable, limits given its size. Such a system would need to rely on more robust national monitoring arrangements overseen by uh, independent domestic authorities and then subject to periodic joint review with the Commission focusing on problematic cases which could be bumped up to a higher level for resolution. And this is actually how the best forms of EU regulation work, for example, in areas like food safety. So just to conclude, uh, we argue that reforming the performance-based financing system in this sort of way would make it possible to retain the benefits of the RRF governance model in terms of national ownership and the linkage between investments and reforms while avoiding and overcoming the deficiencies and the perverse effects of performance-based financing as we document in our study. And we think also these findings are very relevant to current proposals to adapt elements of the RRF governance model to other EU policy issues like the reform of the fiscal framework, but also the possible transformation of the cohesion fund. So thanks for your patience. And I hope I haven't gone too long. Professor, uh, Professor Buti, you are now a little bit more free to speak than you were uh, last month. So we, we, we listen to your guidance. Thank you very much. I have taken liberties in the past also, so it's even freer. Okay, no, thank you very much. I'm very happy that we have, uh, we, I hope he's still there, we don't, we don't see him. Uh, Mario Nava, uh, uh, everybody has a past, you know, and Mario and myself, we have a past together, having worked in the Commission for many years, but we have, you know, a more specific uh, uh, common experience. We both contributed as rapporteur to the SAPI report of 20 years ago. And in the context of that, um, uh, that was the time when Romano Prodi was here yesterday, he was president of the commission, and we worked in the group of policy advisors uh, uh, at the time. And as a background paper for our contribution to the SAPI report, we wrote um, what I consider you know, uh, I've written many things, but this is one of the things I'm happy about, about having written, which is, was a working paper actually published by the European University Institute at the time, so somehow uh, it was a bit predestined to uh, end up uh, in, uh, at the EUI eventually. Um, and it, the title of the working paper was uh, uh, Towards a European Budgetary System. Mm? Um, and I read you the very first um, little paragraph of the, uh, of the paper, and it's, it, it, here what it says. As it stands today, so 20 years ago, the EU budget is a historical relic. Three failures are most evident. First, its spending composition is heavily tilted toward the support of a declining sector, agriculture. Second, it is almost impossible to reallocate spending across time and across policies to reflect economic and political priorities. And third, its size bears no comparison to any of the budgets of the EU countries, and it is unrelated with the EU goals. I think if you take uh, the TIPEX and, uh, and, and uh, change the date, uh, I mean, we are not far away from an assessment uh, which is, uh, you know, relatively valid today um, uh, as well. I mean, a lot has been done, and clearly there is the novelty on Next Generation EU at the RRF, but I think the issue that we, po we put on the table at the time still um, stand. Then the response in the paper was to look at the EU fiscal relations as a budgetary system in a system of vertical coordination. That was the proposal uh, at the time. So what I want to do here uh, is two things. One is uh, what are the 
overall, and I, I zoom out, I don't zoom in, uh, compared to the previous uh, speakers. Um, so the first uh, question is that, what are the conditions in order to put in place this EU budgetary uh, system? Uh, and second, uh, what uh, the EU level would look like um, coherent with these uh, um, with these ideas and coherent also with the um, next generation EU and the recent developments and in passing I'll make a comment on Jonathan's point on diagnostic uh, um, monitoring. So, okay, first one, first point here, okay, is, okay, let's go to directly to the uh, last slides, there's only two. Um, so basically what you have here is in this slide, I try to encapsulate in this slide here, basically um, 20 years of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, budgetary relations. Uh, so we have, uh, you can see here is, uh, um, I have uh, a dimension which is the central fiscal capacity, so whether something on the center exists or not, you know, in a meaningful way, and whether um, you have binding fiscal constraints on the, on the national uh, budgets. And you have the combinations, the four combinations that you see here. And if you follow the arrows, you will see the, the, the evolution of the system over the past, let's say, 15 to 20, 20 years or four. So, uh, I, I, so basically pre, pre a global financial crisis and then uh, and then till till today so what you see is the the first one so you have the global financial crisis the Lehman Brothers and uh, morphing into the sovereign debt crisis in uh, Europe and the answer at the time was uh, um, there was no fiscal center fiscal capacity we were in the Maastricht uh, <coughs> regime uh, in the pure Maastricht regime and um, we had the, the uh, binding fiscal constraints, and I have to say here, binding fiscal constraints essentially on vulnerable countries imposed by the markets. So it was the austerity, uh, the austerity period, which also were uh, taken up in the, um, uh, in, the, in the management of the EU IMF uh, programs for uh, countries uh, in trouble. Okay, you can see in red here, I consider this is not an economic equilibrium. It's not something that is sustainable uh, over time. So we uh, moved then into the uh, sovereign debt crisis aftermath. So it was essentially after the, I put 2014, but this is the, let's say, after the coda of the, whatever it takes of Mario Draghi, 2012, uh, um, uh, and, and the, let's say, the, the more peaceful, um, uh, market environment uh, which uh, uh, followed uh, that. And there we had uh, uh, basically no, no, we still did not have a, a central fiscal capacity and the pact was, uh, the Stability and Growth Pact was actually implemented in a very flexible uh, manner uh, at the time. So uh, my conclusion here is that this is not an institutional equilibrium. So you cannot run a currency area based on a no, no. Uh, of this, uh, um, uh, on, on the, the, these two dimensions. Then you move to the third quadrant, and here, that's what happens with next generation EU following the pandemic uh, uh, shock. So next generation EU, and then GEC is the application of the general escape clause uh, where we suspended the rules of the stability pact. And, uh, um, okay, my conclusion here, again, uh, I mean, I, I go, you know, first order, uh, first order assessment, this is not a political equilibrium. You, know, you cannot have something that is uh, you know, a central intervention and actually not applying uh, uh, some form of rules at the, at the national level. So, okay, we ha these are the, th the, third, the three quadrants through, uh, f for, you know, which allow a thing to capture the journey um, uh, or till, till today. So what is, in my view, the stable uh, quadrant where economic, institutional, and political equilibrium is, uh, conditions are met, 
and it is the yes yes uh, quadrant so and here you see the arrow is uh, you know in dotted uh, forms we are not there and i think here what would characterize this is a situation in which you have uh, credible um, robust um, constraints uh, on uh, at the national level, and you have a, a, a central fiscal capacity uh, of a permanent form, not of a, of a, a temporary, uh, temporary nature. And here, the, the big issues is the uh, supply of European public goods and the issue of the own reform, the own resources, so the fiscal extraction uh, type to buttress the um, financing of the EPGs and buttress also the possible issuance of common debt um, to, finance, uh, to finance this. Now, I'm not going to spend time on that, but if you look at the, I have, uh, it can be distributed, uh, I have another slide, which is uh, the one that you see here, and it is the, um, the evolution, uh, the real Lamentonia moment, the evolution in the US back to uh, pre-war of independence and Hamilton, etc. and you'll see the same type of journey but eventually landing in the, um, in the quadrant uh, yes, yes. Okay, so this is the, um, the, first, uh, the first point. So the conditions which allow to get to the, um, I think to what, are in my, what is in my view a stable EU budgetary system. Second question is that what you can do um, in terms of the uh, reform of the EU level, uh, so the EU budget, in order to, you know, get, uh, uh, to get there uh, and to have uh, a proper interaction, the, what we call in the paper Mario and then subsequently also vertical coordination between the, the EU budget and the national uh, budget. Okay, now I really look at the, you know, possible new steady state um, how would you organize the EU budget? And then one can see how to get there. And I, I go, uh, go back to um, uh, a moment to things that I think I um, said yesterday during the other uh, session. Um, I think one should rethink the EU budget based on the experience of Next Generation EU and the RRF under two big chapters. And the two big chapters are on the one hand, genuine European public goods, so public goods that you, uh, in the economic and non-economic area, that you finance and deliver at the European level. And then you have a second chapter, second big chapter in the EU budget, which is essentially inspired by next generation EU, which would be based on, let's say, transfers to the, to the member states, but for goals which are coherent with country-specific recommendations and with EU priorities. So you have genuine European public goods on the first, on the first chapter, and what I've called European public goods by aggregation in the second, uh, in the second chapter. So this, I think, what I would, uh, where I think we should go, and since we are talking about the next, the, uh, you know, big priorities for the, uh, to have a proper informed debate in view of the European elections, I think it's something that is a proposition that one could test with the, um, with the electorate. Now, uh, let me end with uh, uh, two considerations. Okay, one, we know that in, uh, uh, rarely there is a big bang uh, in Europe, okay, next generation EU was a big bang prompt by uh, a major crisis, but otherwise uh, we tend to do things step by step. So uh, I think the first opportunity here to start to move in this direction, which would be highly desirable in my view, is uh, to take seriously the um, forthcoming um, review of the MFF, so the multi-year budget. Uh, we have a mid-term review. It is forthcoming in the next weeks. The Commission will come forward with proposals. I think it would be, an in, uh, it would be usually in the past, uh, 
these type of midterm reviews have been uh, you know taken as you know minimal with minimal changes i think this time round i think it would be it could be the opportunity to actually to make the first steps in the supply of european public goods and go in the direction that i um, try to uh, explain uh, before um, so this is the first consideration. Now the, final, the second consideration and final one is what Jonathan said on diagnostic uh, monitoring. Okay, I, I find personally it is the conclusion is too harsh on the on, on next generation EU. Um, okay, there is, I think there is a lot to learn and I'm sure the, the contribution, uh, the study which uh, we are going to study and, uh, and uh, look at uh, with, uh, with utmost uh, uh, care, and uh, you know, my colleagues in the Commission will do that even uh, better than uh, me, is, you know, offering, uh, is going to offer um, uh, very, very important uh, um, uh, options uh, and, and recommendations. I find that uh, the move from an input-based, let's say, or in invoice-based approach towards an output-based uh, approach, I think, is a great improvement. It clearly puts the bar very high uh, for, the, for the member states, much higher for the member states. I think a step that we have not done yet, or not done fully, is to move from input to an output-based to an outcome-based. I think that is uh, the final one, which would look at the, the way it is um, uh, the reforms and investment actually produced uh, also macroeconomic or sectoral uh, relevant uh, uh, changes, uh, um, I think is still uh, not, full, not fulfilled. But why do we have the system of, of, uh, um, of monitoring that we have with milestones and targets? Uh, Okay, if you want to summarize it, taking um, you know, the uh, economic theory into account, it is because we are in a system of, uh, in which you have the European Commission as the agent of the, of the Council being as a principal, but in a, in, a, in a situation of imperfect confidence. So that is the problem the, or the issue that has led to, the, to this type of, uh, you know, structuring milestones and targets. Uh, and so, so one has to understand what the roots are. If you recreate the uh, confidence and there is, you have a freer agent, still with the principle, obviously, being uh, the member states and the council, I think you can do something more flexibly than you have, uh, uh, that, you have that, that you have indicated. Second, I have to say, I would not agree, but here Mario can correct me, uh, he's, uh, he's there. I would not agree to de depict the Commission as uh, you know, a rigid body on that. I mean, what we have done, we have, we have actually worked very closely with the Member States uh, to adapt the... Um, uh, to adapt to, to change the situation, to adapt to the you know, projects and targets in a rather flexible uh, manner. What you could do below the line, we did it because it was an adjustment at the operational level. I think what the, um, the RRF regulation requires that you go through Article 21 to, to change the, uh, the, 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 uh, the program so they are, it's more cumbersome, but I think we have helped informally member states uh, um, a lot in that, um, uh, in that direction. Clearly what we said uh, is that, um, okay, changes have to be justified well, they have to be tailor-made, they cannot be pret-a-porter, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, changing, uh, wholesale changes to the, to, the, um, uh, to the program, but I think the Commission overall has shown, uh, I think, a good understanding of the you know, changing circumstances. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Buti. Uh, let me ask for a little bit of patience from uh, our speakers uh, in, the, in the room, uh, Barbara and Luca, and we go to Director General Nava. You've been uh, called into questions a couple of times. You have four, fi four five minutes, actually, uh, to give your contribution, uh, perhaps responding to what Buti is saying, if we can get to the yes, yes, 
uh, in terms of fiscal capacity and uh, strong uh, fiscal rules, while also at the same time uh, uh, your comments on the lessons from the RRF. Thank you very much and, uh, and many thanks to my very good friend Marco for his presentation. I must say, had I spoken first, I would have not been able to be as eloquent as him, but I would have uh, certainly started from the same point, which is the point of what has happened to the, to the EU budget and the EU way to do it. I would probably, um, I would probably even go one step before uh, and look at the classical Musgravian, uh, uh, the classical Musgravian division of what a public authority should do and what do you do at the local and at the at the regional, at the national and at the supranational level, uh, meaning the European level. And I think uh, what has happened in the let's say third and fourth uh, square of Marco, so what has happened since. COVID and war is that uh, the European Union has entered the area of macroeconomic stabilization. We did it a little bit uh, with the Juncker plan, although in a, in a different way, but somehow the Juncker plan, if you remember, was to cope for an investment gap, which is what we have uh, done with the Juncker plan, and then it had various, uh, uh, various declinations. But here with COVID and the war, it became very clear that the two issues that we were at, that we had at hand, COVID and war, were too big even for the biggest of the member states, and therefore uh, only a joint action was possible. Very much what uh, uh, the first professor was saying: uh, uh, stronger when uh, when acting united, which is not an ideological position. It's just uh, if you go back to the to the paper of Mark and myself of 22 years ago. It's just the fact, as we put it there, that uh, at some point the coordination costs are much smaller than the benefits from coordination. And if you think how we got out of COVID and how we are coping with war, well, that is very, that is very evident that, what is, uh, that is exactly what happened. Now, the fact that Europe is doing uh, macrofinancial stabilization it's not a banal fact because it means that there is an implicit recognition. And I repeat, this is all economics. It's got nothing to do with ideology, being pro or against Europe. It's got nothing to do. It's just the, the, the strength of the market, as Marco put it in his first, uh, in his first uh, uh, square. But this is some sort of institutional market, quote unquote, if you want. So the fact that we have uh, we have done that clearly has changed the the dynamics. I would also tend to agree, but here you know I'm a commission official. I could definitely be biased, but I would also tend to agree with Marco that the commission has shown a very very high degree of flexibility, both at the very beginning when conceiving the plan, when thinking aloud uh, nearly of uh, what could be done, and then going to negotiate. With the, with the Council and the Parliament, but also later on when it came, the war arrived, the, the plans were already made, and we had to conceive a major um, addition. Actually, in many countries it's called the addendum, which had to do with, uh, uh, with energy, the energy situation. So I would say that the, the flexibility has been, uh, has been used. So on my side, I believe that we have, uh, a, we have a number of useful uh, uh, progresses that have been made. The one of moving away from costs to results, it's also very important. It belongs to the RRF uh, and, uh, and clearly I think even intellectually uh, when uh, the first students will start writing thesis about that, but intellectually I think has been a, a, major, a major step forward because uh, well, first of all, it gives, uh, um, in a way, it gives, it puts onus and responsibilities on the member states, but at the same time, it ensures that the commitment is there. Now, one thing I always say at this type of debate is when you look at the next generation EU, it was approved in July 2020, 750 billion. Six months earlier, in January, uh, member states could not agree on a small increase of the budget of 15 
billions, so 50 times smaller. Yes, okay, there was not yet COVID. Actually, COVID there was, but we didn't know it. So there was no COVID emotion, so to speak. But clearly the difference between uh, a no for 15 and a yes for 750 has to do with the fact that we moved toward the resultative method and that we introduced the aspect of reforms. Actually, the reforms are the true novelty because uh, the reforms are what make the mechanism interesting because is if reforms are made, then there is growth also uh, in countries where difficulties to grow. I mean, many pe few people uh, have observed, at least in this round table, that uh, 2021 and 2022 were very special years uh, in some respect because were the first two years since 25, where the South-North convergence has happened. And not only has happened, but if you check the, the commission forecast that Marco's uh, former DG produced every three, four months, you see that in those countries who have grown less, uh, one of the greatest contribution to growth was the indirect effect of the RRF in the other countries. So I do believe uh, that uh, the RRF has uh, brought, uh, brought about greater integration for sure, greater economic, let me say, rationality, or if you want, greater economic ability to respond to the, to the crisis. And to close, because my four minutes are over, but to close, a month ago, we have done a Eurobarometer. And we have asked to the Eurobarometer, to the, to the people of Europe, we have asked, what are the things that you would expect from Europe? And uh, the Eurobarometer is all public, uh, you can check it. Response number one. Please help us in crisis. So the people of Europe, in a way, realize that when the crisis is big, it's logical that the response comes big as well. So comes no. That's the first thing they say. The second thing that they say is please, please help us with knowledge and best practices from other countries. Once again, this is a very good proof of integration. They know there are possibilities to get from other countries, and they say this can be done. And the third thing that they say is, please help us with, uh, um, with knowledge and, and competence uh, that you can bring, even before asking for money. This is a very mature uh, type of response uh, on the side of the European citizens, or if you want, is a response which proves that the RRF has probably changed the picture in a, in a very good way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director General Nava. If you want to come back, uh, you're allowed to go back to the panel. Uh, you contextualize the RRF and Next Generation EU as the Commission uh, doing some macrofinancial stabilization. I think that's the perfect moment to bring in the view of macroeconomists uh, and, and, central <laughs> and central bankers. Should we go to uh, Vice President Kohl uh, first for, uh, for, a comment, uh, for a comment on this? And, uh, uh, should we go to a fiscal towards a fiscal capacity with fiscal with uh, with fiscal rules? A comment on the next generation EU and on the Commission role on macro uh, stabilization. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is a very 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 complex topic, and uh, uh, I, I quickly go through my points. Uh, of course, they are radical as always, um, but uh, I the goal is to raise competitiveness not only from uh, for Europe as itself, but also uh, within Europe. And I think this, is a, this should be our goal. Uh, then we should look at the duration of the bonds as well and of the, finance, uh, of the financing. Uh, technology uh, catches up much faster these days uh, than 10 years ago. And uh, the duration of the of the of the funding should also be looked into that. Then the next point is uh, the general. There is a huge gap between political desires and what has been pointed out on all side by all sides here. The technical possibilities that we that we see. So those these gaps need to be kind of 
despite the fact that we do a lot of collaboration and discussion, and, and Marco has especially pointed that out with when he says he works with the national uh, states uh, to adapt the, the frameworks for that, but this, is, uh, this will constantly be an issue. There was a good reason why Jim Buchanan was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in economics, if you look at public choice. Uh, next point. Uh, I agree with the monitoring and the measuring. Uh, I would even go further and introduce KPIs on, on, on that front. Um, and then the general question is, what is, um, uh, uh, what, what, what is in the, what incentives do we also create for the capital markets in Europe? Because after all, we need that to grow. And I mean, this is the, the goal to grow and create prosperity. So I would also, and we have the, at the Austrian Central Bank have looked into that, what the, Brit, what the Bank of England has implemented a long time ago was the growth fund. Uh, and this was very successful, uh, successfully done by uh, the cooperation between the banks and the Bank of England to leverage uh, money in a different uh, in a diff uh, in a different way. So this is something that we could, in addition to what has been put on the table already, use uh, to have uh, additional sources. And after all, and it, I think it has been mentioned many times, this can only work if we rethink the EU budgeting process and if we rethink the entire budget there. And uh, uh, lastly, I would also mention that uh, moving from input to output and to outcome is truly important. And the checks and balances that uh, have been on the table for the now, since we are in midterm more or less, uh, are not sufficient. And the cost-benefit analysis of the respective uh, projects should also be uh, in, uh, well should be kind of uprisen and uh, after all KPIs are already mentioned but I think this constant monitoring is a true um, uh, a true issue and personally I am very critical about financing this via taxes because eventually uh, this this will kind of create a, um, an endless big uh, hole for uh, for desires, and we also would have to kind of rethink the entire system of uh, uh, of how we run the European Union, of how we run Brussels, and therefore I'm, I'm critical on that front. I would rather go to. Uh, issues like growth fund collaboration and leveraging it together with uh, the financial markets. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll give you the floor right away. You are in the, in the perfect position because you have a scientific, scientific base, but also the banking and the business flavor. So uh, how you see the, move, the movement of the yeah. union? And I also have the advantage of being the only one that can only ask questions and uh, is not forced to, uh, to answer questions. So I am in a privileged position uh, today. Um, so, uh, um, I very much uh, I like to listen to the presentation before, uh, full of uh, interesting, um, uh, interesting points. Uh, I will not comment on uh, uh, the, uh, the part concerning the future developments uh, of the, you know, the, uh, the fiscal framework in the, in the EU. Uh, I agree with, uh, uh, with this uh, idea of uh, uh, future vertical integration. I remain uh, concerned by the uh, likely they can get uh, that result uh, because of uh, political feasibility, but uh, I, I would like to get, to get there. Let me uh, instead uh, go back to the uh, issue of the RRF. Um, uh, also, uh, concerning the uh, possibility on how to make this RRF work, because I mean, it's very useful to think about uh, the framework and develop in the future, but we are in 2023, we'll, uh, the end of the program is 2026, so we still have a lot of room to go. And uh, it's a big chance for, uh, for some countries, including the one we, we are now in, uh, to, uh, to do something about uh, potential, potential GDP growth, not just uh, uh, stimulus to, uh, to current demand. 
Uh, the issue is very relevant, I, I want to stress that, uh, um, because uh, first of all, uh, when I look at my own forecast for GDP growth in Italy, uh, they are heavily reliant on the assumption we, we are making about uh, the implementation of the RR, uh, RRF uh, in the short term, in the medium term, and the long term. Second point, uh, I'll, uh, I started to see uh, an increasing degree of attention by investors uh, regarding the implementation of the, um, of the, um, uh, the national, uh, national plan in Italy. Uh, which was not present a few months ago. It is now beginning to, to rise, probably because of an international news flow on the implementation of a plan in, in this country. Uh, so this is something that at present is having no effect whatsoever on the, in the bond market uh, because of other events, including the sharp increase uh, in uh, domestic demand for government bonds uh, in this month, especially from the retail sector. But um, uh, looking ahead, I think this is something that could uh, eventually affect uh, the risk premium. So uh, we should be very careful and uh, think seriously on how to make this, uh, this plan work uh, here in, uh, in Italy especially because in the end uh, this is the country which, has, uh, which is relying the most on the implementation of the RRF. And there are two related questions that I would like to, uh, to make to, uh, to the panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, um, what we can do to improve the implementation performance of the plan, of this plan now. So what is feasible given the uh, institutional framework we have, given the regulation which uh, uh, governs the, the plan. So what, what, what are the, uh, the areas in which you can imagine to, to act in order to improve uh, the implementation performance of the plan? And then I have another uh, related question which comes from uh, my personal experience. When the, uh, the plan was launched and the activities uh, began, uh, I noticed that within the bank, it, almost immediately, um, um, a, sh a sharp increase of activity related to the plan. We were not uh, directly involved, but we were preparing to help our customers uh, to do work related to the plan. So uh, this uh, makes me think that uh, uh, we have a great potential in mobilizing um, human capital uh, within, within the private sector uh, to improve uh, the implementation of the plan. So I was thinking um, whether you have uh, ideas regarding changes to make to the, to the plans uh, in order to improve uh, uh, the, this mobilization of uh, human capital, which is present in, in the economy, I mean, in the finan finance sector, in professional services. Uh, there are many competitors that could be mobilized to, uh, to make the implementation uh, more, uh, more effective. Uh, uh, related point, uh, there is a discussion at present uh, um, within my bank, but also I see that uh, in the papers uh, regarding a shift uh, of, the, of the plan towards, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, measures that uh, provide uh, incentives, subsidies or tax credits to the private sector uh, and make the sp uh, have the spending done, the projects being implemented by the private sector. I mean, this is not feasible in all areas of a plan. I wonder if you have any ideas regarding the potential for uh, these changes to, to improve the implementation record. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the contribution and the questions. We are, of course, running uh, late, and my apologies to the Green European Foundations that is running the next uh, session, very interesting, on uh, energy transition. We have uh, two questions by, uh, by Luca, uh, which we might give to maybe Nara, Onava or Buti one minute, uh, one minute to respond. Uh, Mario Nava, you want to intervene? Uh, if, if, if you can, on the... the as you one. like. On the, on, the, on the flexibility and the implementation uh, that was the question was just raised. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think also Marco has, uh, has, made the, has made the response. One thing that to me is very obvious uh, uh, from here, first of all, I like very much what Luca said about the fact that uh, the mere existence of the plan increases the productivity because it focuses mind. But apart from that, uh, flexibility and, uh, and implementation, one should not take, a, let me say, a theoretical approach. This is very much of a pragmatic issue. So I could find you a very good example where there is uh, some good implementation. I could find you a very good example of the opposite. I could find you things where uh, the flexibility has been done till the end. I could find you many other reasons why it has not been done. So I'm, I'm frankly... Uh, 
probably because of the position where I am, but I'm frankly a little bit reticent to take uh, the question in a very, um, in a very uh, open way. I'm happy to discuss point by point. That's what we do for, for living. I'm happy to discuss project by project, but I don't see a, a general issue where one could generalize and say, you are flexible, you are not flexible or whatever. Thanks a lot. So we close it here uh, with uh, two major uh, issues that we don't have a gender-based panel and we have uh, uh, inherited a, uh, a delay and we are adding to it. So we are adding injustice to the injustice. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, I don't know if there was a, an intervention or a question, otherwise I, I would wrap up. Please. It's just an intervention because I know you won't have time. But the, the one time, it was fascinating to he listen to your presentations, but linking Jonathan's, I mean, really, all the presentation, there is a word we haven't you, uh, heard, is the democratization of the recovery fund. What is the democratic uh, dimension of it in terms of monitoring by national parliament, civil society actors, I, I would have been fascinated to hear you on the European Parliament's recent, uh, recent requirement that the first hundred uh, recipients uh, of projects mon project money in every member state be made visible. Um, probably we need more of that, both in terms of if you have tax no, no taxation without representation, and there will be a lot of taxation, and you made it all very clear, and Marco made it so clear, we, we, sh we would expect much more democratic control of this whole process. And in fact, not just for the recovery fund, but all of the other funds of the EU, where the recovery fund could be a trailblazer because of those recent developments. And indeed, we know that uh, sunshine is the best, uh, the best warranty of effective and however flexible it's going to be but an effective action. So I would have liked to hear that dimension. Okay, this, is, this was more a, a remark than, uh, than, uh, than a question, because uh, mm. uh, um, undemocratically we need to close the, the session. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, this debate will have to go on. And uh, um, let's clap our... Uh... Also, Mario. Ciao, Mario. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario.